I will give you thanks with all my heart. I will sing your praise before the heavenly beings. I will bow down towards your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your constant love and truth. You have exalted your name and your promise above everything else. On the day I called you, you answered me. You increased strength within me. All the kings on earth will give you thanks, Lord. When they hear what you have promised, they will sing for the Lord's ways, for the Lord's glory is great. Though the Lord is exalted, he takes note of the humble, but he knows the haughty from a distance. If I walk into the thick of danger, you will, do, you will preserve my life from the anger of my enemies. You extend your hand, your right hand will save me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Lord, your faithful love endures forever. Do not abandon the work of your hands. This is the word of the Lord. All right. Good morning, New Eden Church. It is awesome to be with you this morning. As Joel said, my name is Luke Whaley. I am the director of Summit Students at Summit Crossing Limestone. Um, And so if you uh, don't know what Summit Crossing Limestone is, Joel just talked about how uh, we got to be a part of sending you guys out. Uh, And it has truly been a blessing to get to partner with you guys in a lot of ways. Uh, I've had the pleasure of walking quite close with a lot of your church family here. And so in a lot of ways, as Joel said, this morning is a sweet family reunion for me. Uh, Super stoked to be here and to be worshiping with you guys. As I also said, my role is with students, so that means two things this morning. Uh, Number one, I am definitely not the guy who teaches here weekly at New Eden. Uh, And number two, I'm definitely not the guy who teaches weekly Sunday anywhere. And so uh, take that disclaimer for what it is. But in in all seriousness, I am very excited for the opportunity just to get to uh, walk through a psalm with you guys this morning. Um, My wife and I have been leading students for about three years. And in that time, we have found genuine great joy in getting just to dive into text and see what God has for us in those texts and getting to, to teach. Um, I've gotten to obviously teach a little bit on Wednesday nights and through those things and have found just a lot of joy in it. So I do consider this morning a really fun and awesome opportunity and certainly a great privilege. Uh, last thing before we dive in, just piggyback on what Joel said, we are just coming back from our week in camp. It's an exciting week. It's an awesome week. Uh, when I told people um, that I was preaching the week after, they're like, what in the world are you doing? Because um, camp is awesome. It's this grueling, exhausting, beautiful amazing picture of grace, but it is tiring, especially for, for those that are in leadership. But just to, um, you know, come back around, be on the back end of that, be to the point where I am now teaching after camp, I just feel so encouraged to be here. Um, you, both of your pastors were at camp this week with us. They've been there for the past two years, Kevin and Joel. Um, Joel, each, each night uh, just continues just to relentlessly preach the gospel. That's why we love having him there. He, he is faithful just to cling uh, to the truth of Jesus. And um, not only does he do that each night, he's also up in the middle of the day eating lunch with us, uh, playing spike ball with us. He is the best water balloon thrower in the camp at all times, um, and he's, just, he's present with us. And so we're thankful for you guys sharing um, just your pastor with us and that we were able to have Nui and be a part of that. Kevin's up at the break of dawn every morning um, teaching a devotional. We, we, I mean, we really, really cut a lot of sleep for our students during this camp. And each, each morning, they're still up at 6.30 in the morning um, just to go hang out with Kevin and a few of our counselors who are available. So um, we're thankful, thankful for the partnership in New Eden. This week was a sweet week, and, and it was awesome to get to hang out with them, and I'm excited to do so more in the future. All right, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to dive in and continue our summer in the Psalms. Jesus, we love you. God, I'm thankful uh, just that you are a gracious God uh, that is faithful um, to meet us where we're at uh, this morning as we open your word and um, we, we see what you have for us. God, I pray that we would just uh, we would see you over everything else. Um, God, that you would take away any distractions that we may have coming in here and that you would just allow us to clearly hear from you. That when we encounter you, that when we hear what you have for us in your word, we would not be able to leave the same. Um, God, that we'd be encouraged, that we would truly be able to see um, what the good news of the gospel is and how it, it, it engages us in having the ability to be thankful and to be grateful um, despite our circumstances. Um, Lord, would you hide me behind your cross? Would this be a moment, morning that is about you, um, and not about any, any name or anyone else but you, Jesus? It's in your name that we pray. Amen. 
So my wife and I, we are gigantic movie fans. Uh, If you know me in the room, you know this to be true. I am constantly at like movie premieres. I'm literally wearing an Iron Man bracelet right now. We watch a lot of movies. It's a huge part of our student ministry. It's how we've built relationships with our students as we go see movies. And my all-time favorite set of movies is the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Love the Lord of the Rings trilogy. I don't think there's any higher echelon of movies than Lord of the Rings. I got a guy who agrees with me. It's awesome. Um, Return of the King, the finale of, of of the trilogy is my favorite movie, but throughout the story of Lord of the Rings, one of my favorite parts in the story is this battle. Uh, it's called the Battle of Helm's Deep, and if you've seen the movies right now, you're, you're starting to picture this battle. If not, um, you, can, you can vision it with me here. It's just this epic scene where there's a fortress, and the evil enemy is coming in, and our heroes are trying to survive. They're trying to defend this last battle. Um, It's this epic scene. Heroic things are going on. And you're you're just loving every minute of it. You're going to see all your favorite characters be the heroes. Um, But as the the scene continues, uh, we begin to kind of notice that our heroes, it's, it's not going well. Um, they're, they're starting to um, lose a few of the encounters. The things are trying, starting to kind of trend towards the fact that our heroes may lose. And you're nervous and you're sad and you're like, man. And we even get to the point in the scene where our heroes like decide in this thing, hey, we're going to make one last stand, but we're pretty sure we're going to lose. Like, this is the end. We're going to ride out with honor, but this is it. But as the scene continues, there's this awesome, awesome moment where over the hill, the sun kind of begins to set, and you see one more of our heroes that we didn't know was there. His name's Gandalf, and he comes with his whole epic army, and he rides down the hill, and the heroes save the day. Everybody saved. Like, where we thought there was going to be a loss, there was now a victory. And it's this really, really cool, beautiful moment. There's a, a spirit of thankfulness, like, yes, we've been saved. And the next time we see our heroes, they're in this great hall and they're feasting and they're celebrating and they're dancing and and they're just so thankful that though they thought they were going to lose, that someone had come in to save them. And and there's celebration going on and that's the, the overall feel of the room. But the camera begins to pan through this celebration in this feasting hall and you begin to see the faces of some of the heroes and the leaders in the room, the, the characters that we've kind of followed throughout the story, the characters we know really well by this point. And we see their faces, and yes, there's a spirit of thankfulness. They're, they're grateful that they've won the battle, but there's also just a soberness to their faces to realize like, hey, this battle has been won, but we're pretty aware that the evil is still out there. If you follow the movies, you know there's, like, there's a whole other movie left. The story's not over. The evil still very much exists. And so, yes, we're grateful, we're thankful, but in this moment, we're also pretty aware that, that there's things to be fearful of. We as humans understand this. We can feel grateful. We can feel thankful. But if you've spent any time in this world, you know that the woes and troubles and the heaviness bring a lot of brokenness, bring a lot of fear and exhaustion and anxiety. There's this tension sometimes of us being thankful while also being aware sometimes our circumstances don't leave us much to be thankful for. The world has always been this way. This morning, we're going to be in Psalm 138. In the Old Testament, God set in place ways for his people to gather and commune together and process and intentionally lean into this tension. And one of the ways they would do this in the Old Testament was they they would bring offerings. So when they would gather in the temple, they would come and they'd bring offerings. And one specifically was called the thank offering. They would come throughout the year to be reminded what they had to be thankful for no matter the times. And so it was just kind of this intentional effort. We're coming to be thankful. And David wrote a psalm, wrote a song to accompany this specific thank offering. And the psalm we're in this morning is actually the song that he wrote. It was a song, a piece of poetry, written to be recited and sung while they were giving the thank offering as a way of setting and guiding their hearts to being thankful despite the circumstances of their lives and of the world. When we walk through this psalm this morning, we're going to see how it can give us direction to our hearts this morning and look at how Scripture calls us to approach God for when we have the reason for gratitude as well as a reason for anxiety and trouble. Uh, We at Summit Crossing have also been going through summer in the Psalms, and so we've been traveling through this awesome book. And I've loved our time in this book because each week is just such a cool thing that week after week, there's just this beautiful truth that the whole scripture is about Jesus. Um, The Bible is is awesome, and and Psalms is kind of one of the more unique parts of scripture because it's really poetic and artistic. And each week, it's just been so cool to see how that art actually points back to Jesus and how he's the fulfillment of all the things that we lament and praise and sing in these songs. And so my cards are on the table this morning. That's where we're going to go again. Uh, Because the reality is if we are going to look at how we can be thankful and grateful despite our circumstances, if we're going to have a heart that is soft towards what what God is doing in our lives, we must constantly gaze upon who he is, 
what he's done, what he's continuing to do, his faithfulness, his work, who he is, that's where our thankfulness must derive from. I think we can see all three of these things in our psalm this morning, and they're actually going to serve as our points. Who Christ is, what Christ has done, what Christ is going to do. Who Christ is, what Christ has done, what Christ is going to do. I think when we look at these things, we will see his glory exalted. We're going to get to take a look at how his kingdom is established and how his purposes are fulfilled. Thankful Josh read the psalm earlier, and so we're just going to go ahead and dive right in. Verse 1, David writes, I will give you thanks with all my heart. So David starts by saying, I I give thanks with all my heart, emphasizing that when we approach God, when we come to him in a spirit and a desire to give him thanks, we bring all that we are. We get to bring all that we are. We don't have to come halfway. We don't have to like, hey, if I'm going to come here, like I don't need to bring all my things. No, we come to him with everything that we are, our whole heart. We leave nothing behind. Verse two says, I will sing your praise before the heavenly beings. When we're talking about heavenly beings, I I looked at a few different translations and different things. Sometimes it says um, lower G gods. Sometimes it says some different things. And so some scholars believe that we're talking about angels, like those are the heavenly beings. We're talking about some, think the more literal translation leans more towards it being like kings and rulers around um, the area. And and some people think that it's it's talking about maybe like um, some false idols or things that were worshiped in other religions. What's the actual answer? I I really don't know. Um, But the point is David is saying, I'm not going to come to you in secret. I'm going to tell you how awesome you are, God, no matter who's watching, whomever, whenever, I'm coming to you and I want to praise you. I'm bringing my whole heart and with a a spirit of excitement, exuberance, I'm coming to praise you. So let's keep going. I will bow down towards your holy temple and give thanks to your name. For your constant love and truth, you have exalted your name and your promise above everything else. This is cool because this is what we're doing today, church. A huge tool God has given us in regards to having a heart that is grateful is the weekly gathering. We spend six days throughout the week in the world and we experience this brokenness and this awareness of just kind of the the darkness and troubleness of this world. And so this gathering is a beautiful piece where we get to come together and sing songs and be reminded and read scripture that, that we have hope in the gospel, that we get to encourage one another. There's an absolute reality that this is true for us in the gathering. But remember, this verse is saying we are not here for ourselves. Do we get benefit? Sure. A huge part of us gathering each week is to find shelter from just a moment from our running each and every day with this broken world. And that is an incredible gift of grace. But we're here for one reason and one reason only, and that's to exalt God. How do we do that? We lean on the one who exalted God perfectly, and that's Jesus. Christ perfectly exalts the Father. He did this through his obedience and faithfulness to him. Through the work of the cross and his resurrection, we see his glory on full display. And we'll talk more about that in just a minute. But we get to gaze on who Christ is. He is a loving and gracious Savior. In this verse, it says, I give thanks to your name for your constant love and truth. Nobody has been more perfect and constant love. Nobody has loved us more perfectly, more steadfastly, more constantly than Jesus has. And so when we're talking about exalting the Father, we lean into the one who has exalted him perfectly already and the one that gives us the ability to do so. And when we see how he's been faithful and to love us constantly and steadfastly, there is great praise that comes from our heart. We're beginning to see how thankfulness, how gratefulness spews up from the inside of us. It's a beautiful thing. Realizing this, when we see this, our hearts were filled with a type of gratitude that leads us to the praise and worship of God. We can look further in this text and see more about Christ's steadfast love. Next verse, it says, On the day I called, you answered me. You increased strength within me. In the ESV, it says, On the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul, you increased. So this is the first point in our psalm this morning. We're going to tangibly look at how we can be grateful no matter the circumstances. David right here starts with this amazing sentence. On the day I called you, what? Answered me. This is definitely entering into the hope territory, the God of the universe, the one who created all things, the one who is king, the one that we're literally here to sing about and exalt today is saying, when you call upon me, I will answer you. He answers us. I think it's important that we look at David's answer to this call 
It says, on the day I called you and answered, you answered me. Um, does it say, and you fixed all my outward circumstances? On the day I called upon you, you fixed my employment struggles. On the day I called you, uh, you, you brought healing to some sickness I was struggling with. On the day, that, on the day I called you, you, you gave me the relationship I needed. No, God does provide these things sometimes. He's absolutely faithful to provide for us in many ways. But right here, we're actually going to get to read that he says something that actually brings even way more hope than the answer to these things. He says, no, on the day I called you, you increased strength within me. The strength of my soul, you increased. David is saying, you did things internally in me that changed the entire way I engage with the external. And every time I've come to you, this is what I do. It's a beautiful thing. And, and what David doesn't even know is he's actually writing about this beautiful thing that's going to, it's like a concept that we see the expansion of God's kingdom throughout time. Remember, this is not just the strengthening of us within inside of us and the strengthening of our soul for our current circumstances. But when you and I call upon him in our desperation and our brokenness and our sinfulness, what occurs? What do we see in the New Testament? When we call upon God, does he rescue our soul? Does he bring us from dead to life? Yes, he rescues our soul. He gives us a new identity. He establishes an untouchable, impenetrable hope and future for all eternity. This is a big deal. This is the biggest deal. Our gratefulness and thankfulness must derive from the ultimate good news of the gospel, that we were dead, but now we are made alive. He took our circumstances, when we call upon him, the strength of our soul, he increases. He gives us a hope like no other. Where does our thankfulness come from? It comes from an understanding of what's actually been accomplished for us on the cross. Your job situation, your health situation, your relationships in life is ultimately fleeing. But in the good news of the gospel, you may call upon the name of the Lord and receive a hope that is like no other. It is granted to you and freedom and for, for absolutely for free. You did not do this. You can't mess it up. It was Christ's faithfulness that achieved this for you. And in that, we cry out songs of thankfulness like David. We exalt his name. It's a beautiful hope that we're given. So drawing back into the context of our psalm, we take back with us this knowledge and this type of restoration we have in the work of the cross. When we call, he brings ultimate restoration. So we can look and see now where does David go next. God is going to use him once again to write about a future time that he doesn't fully understand or have a full grasp. He just knows our redemptive work is going to be realized. David is writing these things, these things, and it's so cool for us to be on the back end of the cross and get to see the hope that's written into these things. This is where we're going to look and see how Christ establishes his kingdom. It's where we're going to look and see what Christ has done, our second point. Moving into verse 4. It says, All the kings on earth will give you thanks, Lord, when they hear what you have promised. They will sing of the Lord's ways, for the Lord's glory is great. Though the Lord is exalted, he takes note of the humble, but he knows the haughty from a distance. In David's time, we know that himself and the people of Israel were the people of God, uh, but many other nations were not. Uh, many other nations and their rulers were against Israel, and we know that there was great persecution and turmoil, um, a lot of lacking of peace in these times, because though David and Israel were the people of God, others were not for God. But we read in these verses, David is declaring his hope and the work that God is going to redeem all these things, redeem all these people around him. Whenever we talk about the word redemption uh, in the context of the gospel, whenever we, we say that word, we're just talking about a group of people being set free. That, that gospel uh, redemption is beautiful because it's us being set free from the bondage of our sin. And we see David declaring this kind of redemptive hope in these verses. David is saying, God, I know that even today as we stand here and we're bringing the thank offering, um, our circumstances may not give us plenty of reason to come with thanksgiving. But we are thankful to you because you transcend circumstances and your kingdom is coming. And when it comes, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that you are God. And so your kingdom is going to come. It's going to come fully and we're going to get to be a part of that kingdom. And David's saying, so even if today the kings are not for you, there will be a day when they will be. The craziness of this is in, in the time that God has placed us, we get to see this better than David did. Think about what we get to see in the New Te Testament. Did the gospel go forth from the Jews to the Gentiles? Yes. 
Have we seen it move and expand to many nations? Yes. Will we one day get to see a gathered people of every tribe, tongue, and nation? Yes, God is establishing himself a kingdom. I know here at New Eden, you guys love to talk about the nations. Your leadership is passionate to do so because we really, really believe that the Bible points to God's heart for the nations all over Scripture. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful thing to get to see God establishing his kingdom. It shows his power. It shows his sovereignty. It shows that he's king. A few weeks ago, uh, our student ministry got to take a trip to Clarkston, Georgia. Uh, if you've never heard of Clarkston, Georgia, I hadn't either, but it's a little suburb right on the brink of Atlanta. And it's actually a refugee resettlement uh, community. And so there's over a hundred nations gathered there because it's just where refugees are resettled. It's one of the um, most, like they call it, the most diverse square mile in the nation. It's just very popular with many different types of people groups. And so we got to take some students there and we partnered with a local organization called GFM, that's Global Frontier Missions. And it was this really cool picture because we tangibly were getting to walk around and see um, in this, this very small space, the glory of God expanding through many tribes, tongues, and nation, nations. Getting to see how cool that is and how a beautiful picture of the gospel it is. And I was hanging out with the leader of that organization um, for security purposes, I'm not really sure if I'm able to share, share his name, so I'm just going to call him Scott. Scott is not his name. Um, but Scott, I was hanging out with this guy, and he and his family were able to spend 14 years in Mexico. And in Mexico, they were working with this tribe uh, that was a very uh, unique people group that had a very unique dialect. And so um, they, were, they were there, to, and they worked with a lot of language learning and a lot of um, Bible translation. That was a big part of why they were there. But their ability to learn this language was 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 a very big deal because it was very unique. And he's telling us about his time there. And it's just so cool to just hear the faithfulness of God's heart just to provide for them while we're there. But they spent 14 or 15 years there. And when they got back to the States, uh, he was telling us the story of when they first got back, he really wasn't sure what was next for him. Um, they weren't sure where they were being called to as a family. And so um, just through circumstances, he ends up on a trip to Atlanta, Georgia to talk with a guy about some possible future opportunities. And through even crazier circumstances, when he's getting lunch with this guy in Atlanta, they run into this guy who's from Mexico. And they begin chatting and he's like, yes, I'm from Mexico. I'm actually from this uh, specific tribe and people group. And it was one that, was ca that spoke the same language as the dialect that he had just learned for these 14 years he'd been there in Mexico. And so he starts speaking to him in this, in this language. And the guy they ran into is just like taken aback. And he's like, I, I don't know how you're speaking to me right now. And they have this really cool conversation. And Scott's able to tell him about the time that his family spent there. And they get into this gospel conversation. Uh, and, the, and the guy ends up like coming to profess Christ as a savior, comes to know the gospel, comes to believe. And it's this incredible like spirit working and a movement of just what can only be explained is like God is doing something really cool becomes a Christian, he then is able to go back and a gospel movement is started in that people group in which they had spent 14 years there. And it's just this beautiful picture that like God does things that do not make sense. He is powerful and he is sovereign and he is establishing himself a kingdom in which one day we from every tribe, tongue, and nation will get to worship him. The realization of who God is, what he promises to do, and the power he's displayed in everything in his kingdom is an incredible reason for us to be thankful. The kingdom of Christ is an established kingdom. Church, no matter your circumstances, if you know Christ, if you have called upon him and you've been welcomed into his family, you are a part of an established kingdom that will not fall. And the king is a hero like none other that loves you, you personally. He cares for you. And, what, and when you trust him be, and, he, and he shows you that he cares for you, like there's a absolute confidence, like, man, I am a part of a kingdom where this guy's got this. He's king. He's Lord. He's faithful. And his faithfulness proves it over and over again. If we take a look back at our Lord of the Rings illustration, our favorite characters were grateful and thankful that the battle had been won. They were very, very pleased to know that they were not about to die and the battle had been won. But they held fear and anxiety over the actual war. The evil was still very much in place. Church, our situation is so much more hope-filled. We may hold fear and anxieties of the battles with this broken world. We may fear and trouble and, and just absolutely grind it out with our health situations, with our relationships, with the woes that we experience in this world. But if you are part of the kingdom of Christ, the war has already been won. Our situation is far greater. In Christ's kingdom, we hold to our thankfulness that the war against evil has already been won. And one day he will come and make all things new in death, and the battles of this world, the things that cause us anxieties, the reason that it's tough to be thankful sometimes, it will be no more. We have much to be thankful for. 
That's good news, church. Established kingdom in which we can claim home, and and that home has a lot of hope. It'd be so easy for the psalm to wrap up here, but it continues, and I'm so glad it does, uh, because these last few verses are where we're going to close out our time today. Uh, One thing we talk a lot about our students is the good news that our God is a relational God. He's a, I'm right here, right now with you, like in this moment, I know you kind of God. He's a loving father type of God. We want to take time to intentionally see this because it's easy for us to forget this and it's such a big part of the gospel. We are fully known and fully loved. God is not far away. He knows us by name. And it's because he's like this, he fully knows our circumstances and he communicates with us through scripture in a way that is evident of this. Uh, I have a lot of people in my life who are incredibly optimistic. It seems like I attract them. Like they're just, a lot of my friends are really optimistic. Uh, Two people that I love very dearly are the most optimistic people in my life. That's my wife and my father. Uh, I'll tell you two quick short stories. Last week, my wife was in in the crowd and she had to bear through this week. My dad's in the crowd, so they'll just have to both live with it. Uh, But my wife loves to intrude her optimism into my health situations. Um, I find it very... um, Just ridiculous. So if I stub my toe or bang my knee against the coffee table, I will promptly fall to the floor um, because this is tragic and I am in pain and I'm very dramatic. And my wife just immediately tells me, you'll be fine. Uh, She will actually even take out her phone and take a picture of me. She has an album of me laying on the floor being dramatic from these things. Um, She is very confident that I will be fine. Um, And I joke about that, but even in in more serious things where like I'm actually nervous about my health, uh, she's quick to tell me, you are okay. You are not having a heart attack. Um, She's a nurse, so she usually can tell me that I'm not having a heart attack. But she's she's quick to say these things. She's optimistic. She knows um, that she can push forward in this way. Uh, My dad, we grew up, we've had many adventures. um, And there's times I can clearly remember where we're going to do something crazy, like jump off a cliff into some water or like hike down this trail or like go into this cool restaurant. And and sometimes I would be like, I'm not sure this is a good idea. And I have vivid memories of my father saying, hey, it's going to be great. Let's go do this. And now that I'm an adult, I like, I can look back on those times and be like, I don't know, that was pretty bold. <laughs> and like, this is, this is intense. Um, and I'm, I'm obviously very thankful for both those people. The Lord has used their optimism in my life in ways that I really needed it as well. But our heavenly father is, 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 is a perfect father. And he is, he is not always like, um, like sometimes we are just to say, Hey, it'll all be good. He actually meets us where we're at. He meets us where he knows our struggles. He's a personal, I'm with you right here kind of God. Our last two verses says this. If I walk into the thick of danger, you will preserve my life from the anger of my enemies. You will extend your hand. Your right hand will save me. And then the last verse, the Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your faithful love endures forever. Do not abandon the work of your hands. I love these two verses. If I walk into the thick of danger, you will preserve my life. In the ESV, it says, though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. God doesn't have David just write about the big picture and the future hope. Uh, He hasn't write about the here and the now. He is realistic, and he talks directly to us in the midst of our troubled circumstances. Don't let this just be hypothetical for you. Really take time to soak in what David is saying here. Really take time to hear him say, if I walk into the thick of danger, like the Lord knows that we're walking in the thick of danger. He knows that we're in the midst of trouble. And so for you right now, what is, what is your thick of danger? What is your midst of trouble? What does that look like for you in your life right now? Because God is meeting us where we're at. And you may say, Luke, well, I'm, I'm right here. I'm hearing you. I'm thinking about my midst of danger. I'm thinking about uh, my troubled circumstances. And, and those things are very, very much still present. But the point of this psalm, the psalm, the point of the context in the psalm, and when they were giving the thank offering, David is basically saying, like, are you here? Are you alive? The logical conclusion for David's context were, was if you were, in fact, here in person, able to give the thank offering, then the Lord had indeed preserved you. That you'd been, you, you are here to, to give a thank offering. The trouble in this time has not quite gotten to you yet. And this is an, an incredible, amazing thing because it's an opportunity for, once again, for us to come and praise God and have another opportunity to thank him. This was massive. But then he moves on to this next statement. He says, the Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. I love this statement because it's just David is saying to the people of God, when you come to him and things around you feel troubled, 
and you aren't sure what to say or do or in our time, like what to post or, or where to go or what to really be a fan of or what, whatever you're supposed to be in this world, when you're not sure about those things and everything feels scattered and all over the place, and we just are so aware of the craziness of this world, he says, stop for a second. Whose purpose is being fulfilled on this planet? Who is going to make sure that these purposes are fulfilled and realized? Who is going to make all things new? Who is going to finish the work that has started inside both me and you? It is him. It is so awesome, amazing, like inconceivable in the midst of us participating in our thankfulness toward him. He is just so gentle and quick to remind us, like, hey, just take a second and remember who's doing the work. Our final point we look at is what is Christ going to do? Christ's faithfulness fulfills his purposes. He will fulfill his purposes for me and for you. In Philippians 1.6, it says, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. In the complexity and craziness of this world, we're going to get some things right We're going to get some things wrong. We're going to enter into some seasons of peace. We're going to enter into some seasons that are the exact opposite. We're going to find ourselves in some seemingly unbearable struggles, but the word of the Lord is saying this, and I promise you, my purposes for you will be fulfilled. My kingdom will be established. I will be exalted because I am king and I am God and I am father of this world and I love you and I care for you. He is going to get it right. And he's going to use us to do it. Uh, A lot of, part of the end of this verse talks about the work of our hands. We could spend so much time there. But we as the church can cling to him, trusting in his faithfulness, as we seek to praise him and thank him and serve him to be his hands and his feet. Ultimately, it's him that we get to lean into. It's ultimately, we we get to lean into him. His faithfulness is greater than our own, and in that we have much to be thankful for. So as we close, let's look back at our three points. I just have a few application questions. We talk about who Christ is. Have you reflected on who Christ is and his love for you? When we talk about our, our inside being strengthened, our soul being strengthened, like what is the condition of your soul? Have you experienced Christ in such a way that he has come in and he has flipped everything upside down? You now have seen his steadfast love for you and you now know there's access to a hope that is different. Christian in the room, are you experiencing Christ in such a way in your life right now that your soul is consistently being strengthened? Are you seeing Jesus? When we see who he is, everything changes. Are we in his word? Are we in his community? Are we we being reminded daily of the absolute amazing attributes of who Christ is and how that actually leads to us having hope? Have you yourself called out to Jesus? Point number two, what Christ has done. Is Christ established kingdom where your hope is set? Is he the hero of your story? Uh, We as humans, we are so designed to worship. We are so quick to latch on to things, to, to kind of build our, our hope around. I am so good at it. I'm good at it with putting my hope in my job. I'm good at it with putting my hope in my relationship with my wife. I'm good at it with just my, me being comfortable. I'm, I mean, I'll, I'll do it with, I love the game of golf so much that sometimes I know it sounds silly. Like this becomes something where my hope is in. And that's literally taking a stick and hitting a ball. Like we, we're so quick to put our hope and our worship in things that do not hold up like Christ does. He is the only one that holds up. I promise you, if you want to put your hope somewhere, if you want to set your chain to something that's going to give you thankfulness and gratefulness and a hope despite your circumstances, it is the kingdom of Christ you're looking for. It's nothing else. Is Christ's kingdom where your hope is set? Is he the hero of your story? And then lastly, what is Christ going to do? Have we as a church been able just to let go and trust that Jesus has this? that he, his purposes are going to be fulfilled, that he's actually the only one that can fulfill those purposes, and he's the only one that we really need to trust to fulfill those purposes. There are, I, like, I'm looking around this room, I'm thinking about the people that aren't even are in this room. There are some awesome people and community that have been built up. And my prayer for you, New Eden, is that as a church, that you guys will constantly run to Jesus together and that you would not count on one another as much as you would the king. And that you would constantly be people that point each other back to him because his purposes, his ability to fulfill those purposes is where our hope as the church lies. Jesus is a good and faithful king. Who he is brings us good news. What he's done gives us hope. What he's going to do establishes that hope permanently. He is a good, good father and one that is worthy of our worship. And so I pray as we um, are making our way throughout life and then we are 
in the midst of trouble and we're in the midst of this broken world that we would constantly see ourselves more and more each day finding ourselves running back to Jesus because he is where our hope lies. Let's pray.